As Jeremy said, uh, the idea really came as a result of a series of blog posts that Michael Stewart Foley wrote uh, about uh, these kind of, I guess we might call them private archives of punk uh, ephemera and uh, cassettes of sh uh, uh, recordings, video and audio of shows and all kinds of things that are still held in pe people's basements and in houses and all, all kinds of places. And I wondered about how um, institutions like the university here, the special collections or other institutions, how they handled or were interested. I knew that there were some uh, collections out there like at the Fales uh, and at Yale and some other places. And I was just kind of curious about um, you know, the process of collecting and documenting and there's a, a been in the recent past a series of texts, uh, books written um, a lot of them are oral histories, a lot of them are anecdotal, but they're increasingly becoming more uh, historical, I guess we could say. Uh, and so I was just kind of interested in a whole series of questions surrounding that, and I went to Rob Cox, the director of the archives, and he steered me to Jeremy, and then together with some other folks uh, here, we kind of dreamed up this kind of colloquium. So I hope everyone uh, enjoys, them, in, enjoys the event and, and gains something out of it. So I think with that, we might just start. Yeah. Um, can you guys hear me? OK. So uh, I'm Lisa Darms. I am the senior archivist at NYU's Fales Library and Special Collections, and also founder of the Fales Riot Girl Collection. And uh, generally, Fales is the special collections for arts and humanities at NYU, um, with special areas of collecting, a couple of which intersect with punk. Um, the first is the downtown collection. And I'm just going to kind of go through images sort of randomly, but um, the downtown collection started by our director over 22 years ago seeks to document the downtown New York art scene of the 70s, 80s, and 90s, encompassing performance art, experimental theater, postmodern dance, poetry, <laughs> paintings, uh, no wave cinema and cinema of transgression, experimental music, punk, and more. Innately cross-disciplinary, the collection is made up of over 200 archives of individual artists, writers, and performers, as well as collectives, theater groups, and artist-run spaces. These include, and this is just a tiny sampling, um, the archives of David Bonarovich, Jimmy Desana, Dorothy Dean, Linda Montano, Martin Wong, Martha Wilson, Nick Zed, Semiotext, Fashion Moda, Guerrilla Girls, Artist Space, Group Material, Epoxy Group. And that's just like a few. Um, so just in terms of a quick overview, it's always really important to me to show material, even though this is just a facsimile. Um, early materials from Judson Dance Theater, which we think of as influential on the downtown scene. Um, so Carolee Schneeman, uh, Martha Wilson, and Schizo Culture, which was really a seminal, or germinal, I like to say, event from uh, Semiotext. Um, a Nick Zed thing and a photograph by Jimmy DeSana. Um, Nelson Sullivan, who uh, probably most of you have not heard of, but who documented his entire life and scene um, on video in the 80s when that was a really hard thing to do. <clears throat> uh, Linda Montana, Montano, whose papers we have, um, you may know her as the person who spent a year roped to Taishing Se in New York as an art life performance. Um, and David Wonorovich, um, who I am so proud to be the archivist for, um, and some materials from his archive. And uh, this is from a leather jacket worn by Abram Finkelstein. So um, this is the way, you know, like an example of one of the ways that downtown has a certain collecting area, but we become strong in certain ways almost accidentally. So we're very, very strong in AIDS activism. That's because um, it's from the 80s. Um, and many of the artists were very active in AIDS activism, and sadly, some of the collections that we received were be because people died um, as victims of that epidemic. And, of course, um, we have more explicitly punk collections. Um, while the collection is not conceived of as punk collection, um, it is filled with punk materials from individual collections like Richard Hell's papers and the videos of the Go Nightclubbing collection to flyers, zines, photos, and documentation of performances throughout individuals' personal papers. On to Riot Girl. So in 2009, 
I founded the Riot Girl Collection, inspired in part by the Downtown Collection. The, downtown, or the collection seeks to document the feminist queer punk youth movement of the 1990s with an explicit agenda to combat the erasure of and dumbing down of feminist activism and to make sure the histories of Riot Girl and its allies and critics are preserved. It currently consists of about 25 archives from individuals and I'm going to read every single one of them. Um, Mark Anderson in Positive Force DC, Becca Albee, Ramdasha Bixim, sitting right here, Tammy Ray Carland, Teresa Carmody, Catherine Deal, Johanna Fateman, Zan Gibbs, Kathleen Hanna, Sheila Hetty, Elena Humphreys, Millie Isaac, Kelly Marie Martin, Mr. Lady Archive, Molly Newman, Mimi Tai Nguyen and the People of Color Zine Project, Outpunk, Yan Sham Shackleton, Laura Splan, and Lucy Thane. Um, the collection is over 100 boxes, um, and while comprising less than 1% of our physical holdings and representing about 5% of my actual work duties, is used by 15% of Vail's researchers. So that's a lot of percentages, but I think they're pretty great. Um, I also published a book from, uh, with the Feminist Press, which I see is here, which is really great, of over 350 images from the collection, and that was an attempt to make the collection accessible in other ways. Um, so just... Um, a quick overview, uh, this is Kathleen Hanna's collection when it came to us, um, so before we moved it into archival folders and labeled everything nicely, uh, but it's quite beautiful. Um, a couple of documents, um, a page from the first issue of Donna Dresch's Chainsaw, um, which I actually use a lot in my teaching as a starting point um, for Riot Girl because she talks about um, this feeling of um, punk not satisfying or um, rep rep representing the true freaks at this point in the late 80s and how we need a real underground. Um, and I see that as kind of a genesis for Riot Girl, even though it wasn't, you know, overt. Um, early Riot Girl zines, uh, this is a new, a new thing that came in was an actual sign from Riot Girl meetings, which is great because uh, I always say the three ways that Riot Girl kind of disseminated itself was bands, zines, and um, meetings. Um, the music and the zines are super well documented, but the meetings are not documented at all because they were intimate spaces, they were safe spaces. Obviously, you weren't going to take notes or photograph anyone, so it's really hard to represent that hist history through an archive. Um, more zines. Uh, there's Dasha's zine, Gunk 4, uh, which I have to say is um, one of my favorite. It's in the collection. More zines. Some flyers. Um, but my point is actually, as I'm showing you all these zines, that the, is that the collection is really not a zine collection. It really is an archival collection built on an archival model um, so that each individual's collecting based on the, the, the things that they were doing. So if they were a zinester, they would have zines, but they'd also have the masters for their zines. So for here, for example, this is Johanna Fateman, Artomania. We have the finished zines, but we also have the artwork that she made for the zines. Um, in addition, there might be documentation of performance, um, draft lyrics, uh, photographs, um, letters, which I uh, think is often the best part of an archive, although with donors this young, it, they're sometimes reluctant to um, donate letters. Can you guys actually read this letter from back there? Uh, um, I can't on my screen. <laughs> but um, this is a great, this is the, the collection that ended up at Positive Force House in DC. Um, and had been in a filing cabinet for 20 years and turned out to be um, possibly thousands of letters sent to them. Um, and then sort of this slide is supposed to represent the mishmash of things. So um, cassette tapes, um, oddities, we have a skateboard, we have the dress that was on the cover of Pussy Whipped. Um, so, you know, an archive is very diverse. Some of you are archivists and know that, but um, this is is uh, much more than a zine library. Not that there's anything wrong with zine libraries. <laughs> They're great. Um, actually, I'm gonna leave this slide here for a minute. So this is where I move on to some questions and worries. Um, we've been asked as presenters to not get bogged down in definitions of punk, and I'm not going to do that. But I do have to pose the question, is the Riot Girl collection primarily a punk collection? Don't get me wrong, I unequivocally 
uh, insist that Riot Girl was a punk movement, and I insist on stressing the importance of the genesis of Riot Girl as a reaction against the failures of many punk scenes in the late 80s to provide a radical inclusive space for anyone but straight white boys. And I say that also from personal experience. Um, but taking the cue from the researchers who use the collection, the classes who come in for sessions with material, and the way journalists and others um, want to speak about the collection, it's clear that for others, the collection be can, can be conceived of in dozens of ways other than just punk. Um, as primarily queer, feminist, activist, in terms of body politics, fashion, aesthetics, experimental literature, performance, avant-garde art practices, publishing, craft, and over and over again, just the zines. Um, as a youth movement, as a neoliberal movement, as a group of misguided middle-class white girls, and confusingly to me, as part of the study of popular culture, which many people have come to me to say, I, I work on popular culture and I'd like to work on your collection, and my thought is always, but this is unpopular culture. Um, but the issue of definitions is also crucial to collecting in general. Both of my collections have detailed collection development policies which attempt to outline and define what it is we collect and what it is we don't. Without these guidelines, archival collections can become diffuse, devoid of context, and meaningless, as well as impossibly large. And yet, both downtown and Riot Girl are difficult to define. Does downtown, I gotta do air quotes, um, even exist? We concertedly insist that it was a scene rather than Riot Girl, which was a movement, and that makes it a bit, a, a bit looser. But downtown is really merely a convenient term because we are human and need language to express ideas, used to encompass a loose set of creative activities in a loosely defined geographical area and time. And yet, despite the porousness of the term, it still managed to exclude. As it is today, the collection is too white to accurately document New York in the 1970s and 80s. And the designation can feel um, tr untrue or misguided even to those who are willingly represented by it. And so I think of seeing Gary Indiana, whose papers we have recently at a reading, refer to downtown as necrophile bullshit sentimental crap, um, which I kind of agreed with. Um, similarly, while Riot Girl means different things to different people, and while my goal, entire goal in creating the collection was to make its history as complex and even contradictory as possible, I still need to be able to define it, what it is I am doing. Um, so this slide is actually a, a funny thing that happened. Um, when we received this collection from Mark Anderson um, from the Positive Force House in DC, um, I had my student staff sort of sort the letters alphabetically, um, put them in a box, and then take them to the department that will process it. Um, when I brought it into that department, someone picked up a piece of paper and said, oh, this one looks cool, and she handed it to me. I turned it over, I said, this is from me. So, <laughs> um, all the letters in there, this one was loose and happened to be from me in 1992 while I lived in British Columbia, sent to Riot Girl, whatever, wherever I thought that was at the time. So, um, you know, I think it's a good way to segue into talking more about myself, maybe, because um, that's what we do. Um, I think the issue of defi definitions also extends to how I define myself in relation to the collections. Um, Punk is the most definitive aspect of my life. I went to my first show in the early 80s when I was 13 in Victoria, British Columbia, where my local bands were Dayglo Abortions, DOA, and No Means No. I had the accidental good fortune to move to Olympia in 1989, where I was initially mystified by the earnestness of the love rock revolution, and where I lived on and off until 2001 when I was an organizer of Ladyfest. Yet I've never had a desire to historicize punk or to make it palatable for others. For better or worse, for the entirety of my teens and into my 30s, no one outside of my subculture mattered or even really existed for me. I went years without watching TV or having an awareness of mainstream politics outside of the wars and my anti-war activism. My primary mindset through much of that time can be expressed in the Bikini Kill lyrics, don't need you. But now part of my job is preserving and interpreting punk for a largely mainstream audience. I absolutely believe in my collection and its total need to exist, its ability to counteract the homogeni homogenizing effect of consumer-driven media, 
and I love that I get to use it to radicalize kids and bring people into contact with actual material culture. But at the same time, I'm ambivalent about my contribution to the academicization of punk, to what sometimes seems like a trend of scholars being primarily interested in their own lives in studying people like themselves. Going back to how we define punk, I'm troubled by how academic punk doesn't represent my hometown scene. Almost nobody from that scene in Victoria attended college or would ever have access to or interest in academia. Equally, I worry about the way punk collecting plays into the market fetishization of punk documents. While library collecting has sometimes been accused of removing documents from the public, I actually think it makes them more accessible. Since the archives I've collected have come from inside closets, under beds, <laughs> and in storage units. Library collecting saves archives from being divvied up and sold at auction, disappearing into private collections. And yet, institutional collecting also feeds that system by legitimi legitimizing areas of collecting. And I worry that the collecting I do only increases the market value and collectability of punk history. And finally, I'm worrying a lot here. Um, I worry that the documentary impulse toward punk inevitably becomes a hagiography. While there are many smart critiques of the failures of punk and Riot Girl in terms of race, where are the, historian, the histories of addiction, poverty, and the inability of a youth-oriented subculture to support us into adulthood? And on that note of sort of the tensions between youth and um, retrospective collecting, I um, give you the rest of these minor threat lyrics. Thank you. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I wish I did. Um, hi, my name is Ramdasha. Um, I am not an archivist or um, don't work in a library. Um, I did a zine called Gunk um, when I was a teenager um, that is seemingly being referenced quite often in these books here. Um, it was, it's kind of funny, I'm 40 years old now and something I wrote when I was like 15, 16 is now like circulating a lot. It's kind of embarrassing sometimes. Um, it was mostly a zine. I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background because probably none of you know who I am. Um, it was mostly about skateboarding and feminism. It started to be more feminist as I got connected to um, older people. Um, in the scene, but I was pretty um, isolated where I was. I grew up in the suburbs of New Jersey. Um, I was mostly in a like upper, upper middle class white town um, that I was not connected to. That wasn't like um, who I identified with. I was poor. Um, so basically, the zine that I did um, was just a shot in the dark kind of reaching out. I had an older friend who. Um, I looked up to who had lived, had moved and lived in Washington or in Oregon and lived near Toby Vale in Bikini Kill. And that's how I ended up getting my hands on um, some of those zines. Um, and that kind of spurred me to start my own, but I didn't really have a big community of punks or people who wrote zines. I kind of was like on my own and then kind of gathered a little bit of a tribe. Um, doing that. Um, so it was like before the internet and all of that. So like what we had was, was zines and it like really helped, helped me and to um, feel empowered in, in, a, in a time when I didn't, I didn't feel. Um, so I'm gonna read a little bit of what I had prepared and try to like go off of that. Um, and I guess like what this, some of this panel is about is how being represented, archived, and how that feels. Um, at the time, I wasn't thinking about the context in which I would be represented in the future or, or, or how that particular scene I was part in would be reflected. What I made in the beginning wasn't really associated with a movement, but as time went on, I connected with other zine writers and punk bands and Forge connected, and, and we did affect the cultural climate. I mean, I'm seeing that now more, like I didn't, I didn't expect that, you know, like, um, and like I was saying, I wrote my zine to, I was 
I was isolated. Um, where I grew up was really waspy, um, <laughs> at times traumatic experiences there. Um, and I didn't have a lot of role models around me and, and any type of people that I felt like reflected any future for me. Um, now that there's official validation from institutions and books and, docu and documentaries, um, I would say there's like a degree of satisfaction about it. And, um, but obviously they never tell the full story. Um, you know, like the meetings, which I actually didn't really go to many riot girl meetings, but you know, just, yeah, so it doesn't really tell that. Um, and I guess there's like a little bit of, like I think about being collected and like, um, like you know, just students sitting in a classroom looking at zines, not actually making zines, that there's a little bit of passiveness to it. Um, you know, and like, I guess I, I do, I don't really have a problem. I don't think I have any type of problem with that. I feel, you know, mostly validated by it and something that I didn't, I didn't really, I don't, I didn't ever see, see that, feel that super important and not that I feel important now, but it is good to know that there is some kind of solid, solidity in like, in this world now to like something I participated in. Um, what I like about the Riot Girl collection that Lisa did is that it's, ex um, that it's accessible and I think that people can handle can people handle the actual zines? Um, and for the most part, I feel good about what I participated in. I was pretty careful and selective to who I spoke to, and I've known Lisa since my like early 20s, probably. And you know, I feel comfortable. I felt comfortable giving the collection to you because you know you're a punk and you were part of the scene. Um, you know, growing when initially when in the, like, I guess around, I don't know the dates, like probably right after 90, 90, 93, 94, I don't know, there was like a big media explosion um, of a first like wave of interest in Riot Girl when all the bands were playing. There was a big convention in DC that my band Gunk played at. Um, and uh, my home address was printed in USA Today. Um, and there was a lot of media tension came to us, a lot of people, reporters, and um, I don't know, like Oprah Winfrey, Sally Jesse Raphael, like all these people were like calling my house when I was like, and it was really crazy. And I um, luckily, I, I don't really regret this at all, but like I remember talking to Kathleen Hanna on the phone and she was saying, she called me at home and was like, hey, you know, a lot of us aren't talking to the media. Um, you know, she wasn't like telling me what to do, but we're not talking to them because they're basically just going to make fun of us, which is like what happened in, in a large part. Um, and I guess that's like what, I, I guess like part of what happens with social movements is like being co-opted of this, the fashion and the style. It is a way to, um, when it becomes like mainstream or that, you know, like some of the value is gone or, you know, but I, I don't know, I, I feel like um, that's sort of separate, like what, like me, like media archiving, that's obviously separate, but I, I do feel like, I don't know, like I, for myself, it's just like, I'm, I'm always like, thinking about reinvention, re reconfiguring, working with what I have. You know, now people are more into, you know, different types of media. So, like, I'm always thinking about, like, what is the most way to reach the most amount of people or what you want to do and, like, flipping it and not worrying about so much, like, the residuals, um, if that makes any sense. Um, let me see. Um, so, yeah. Um, I don't know, as far as being collected at NYU, um, I don't really, I, I feel mostly, I feel mostly good about the collection at NYU. Like I had been asked a couple times by other smaller um, uh, collectors that wanted to hold my zine. And I think people have copies of it, but I didn't give actual my, my like library of zines. I, um, 
and I, I just, I don't know what I was waiting for, but I just didn't give it away. And then when Lisa asked, I was like, oh, this makes sense. And I don't, I don't really have, I, you know, I went to school, I went to college, I dropped out, I went to art school. Um, I don't really have any connection to NYU. It's, um, you know, it's an expensive institution. I don't have any feelings about it. I just, I do think that, that it had, you know, there's longevity there, it's safe. And I don't, I don't know whether it made sense for my, it, it made sense to just be hoarding my zines in my room where no one would see them. I don't, there's nothing like really punk about that. Um, so I, um, I don't know, I just feel like it's pretty hard to keep the reins on radical movements in general. And I, I, I guess the, you know, the riot girl was a radical, it was a radical movement. What I was involved in was radical. Um, and I keep trying to be radical <laughs> till I die, um, whatever that means. Um, and what else? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have much more to say about it um, that I didn't already say. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm um, glad to be here. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to the organizers. I'm so glad to be talking with Dasha and Lisa and into the microphone. Um, I'm Sarah Marcus. I wrote a book called Girls to the Front. It's on sale over there, apparently. Or maybe it's for free. I don't know. <laughs> Fuck capitalism. It's there. Read it somehow. Um, when I was, um, my connection to collections, when I was writing Girls to the Front, uh, the NYU archive didn't exist. There were some zine libraries in places but I was really interested in the networks in which these things were circulating, and so I was, I had seen how earlier um, academic work on feminist zines had sort of looked at zines in isolation and kind of read them as documents, and because of my history um, in Riot Grrrl as a young person uh, in the 90s and my history making zines, I was really super aware of what was gonna get lost if you looked at a zine in isolation of the network in which it was circulating and the relationships in which they were um, a kind of intellectual and creative and personal currency. That's an aspect of collecting that it seems to me that the NYU collection has done such a marvelous job of by grouping things um, according to the donor, according to the person whose collection the stuff was in. And so these networks I think are are preserved as, I mean, I haven't done a lot of research in the collection because as I say, it, it started after the book was done and I was already um, thinking about other things and really, really just so excited about the idea that um, just the profusion of more work and more thinking about Riot Girl that can be done now. Because so my collection, my collecting strategy when I was working on the book or my archives were these personal archives where people's under their beds and in their attics and in their storage units and you know, I would do an interview and then they would say, well, can you come back to San Francisco next month when I've had a chance to go to my storage unit and get the stuff out? And so I would just sort of take, take everything they had and spend an afternoon at Kinko's and then bring it back to them. And that was my collection strategy. And it was very labor intensive and um, everything intensive. Um, and I, uh, I'm, I think that it's wonderful that it, these things are, uh, you know, as Lisa already made the point, that uh, institutionalization actually means more access, not less. And you know, I'm in I'm in an academic situation now. But even before I was, I could go into the door front door of Bob's library whenever and say, you know, I've got some things I want to look at in the Tam and Labor Archives. They just let me in. And I think it's the same with fails. You don't have to like flash a a college ID to get in up to the fails, right? Anyone can come. Anyone can come. So the, so the, you know, <laughs> small print applies. Talk to her, but, but like, <laughs> you know, there, the, um, the over concentration of of intellectual resources in behind the closed doors of the academy is generally a problem. But that doesn't mean that the and, and I think it's an injustice. Yet, whoever has the resources to preserve this stuff, to collect it, to keep it in, you know, climate controlled so that it doesn't mold or get destroyed, and to keep it um, accessible in perpetuity, 
like, let's have it. Because all the zines that I copied when I was writing my book right now, they're in plastic tubs in a non-climate controlled storage unit in Bushwick. And I hope that they're okay. And I hope they stay okay long enough that I can put them somewhere that can take better care of them than I have the resources or time to do. Um, I don't remember what time I started talking, but I think that was four minutes. Anyway, um, so since it's a bit over 10 years since I started writing Girls to the Front, it's about 10, over 10 years that people have been asking me whether it somehow contradicts the ethos of punk to write a history of it, to have a book about it, to collect its ephemera in libraries and archives, to display its history and legacies in museums as the recent traveling exhibition Alien She, curated by Asriya Suprak and C.C. Moss did. For me, I see really zero internal contradiction in such activities to the point that questions about challenges or mismatches are honestly a bit of a head scratcher for me. If punk is to be anti-establishment, quote unquote, which is to say anti-corporate monopoly capitalism and anti the anti-democratic politics and culture that that economic system engenders, then punk also needs to be opposed to the rampant anti-intellectualism that serves the corporate overlords and then there's a whole rant about Donald Trump that I'll just cut, but I'll just say, Donald Trump is not punk, and neither is any other form of know-nothing anti-intellectualism, including those forms that would rather see punk incarcerated inside a relentlessly presentist burden of liveness and adolescent refusal, denying any broader ramifications for its values and denying any relevance for its history. Um, so the idea that there might be some com contradiction between punk and history relies, it seems to me, on a concatenation of two competing and irreconcilable claims. First, that punk means something politically and culturally as a response to an unfolding procession of present moments with a meaning that deserves to be preserved against potential threats to its integrity, that's one, and two, that punk ought to not be interested in its history in any overarching way. Um, and I think the, the, the contradiction between those should be pretty obvious, but basically if like politics doesn't happen strictly in the present, it happens in an unfolding of time. So with that in mind, I'm just going to uh, offer some reflections on archives, culture, or politics, and temporality that maybe can serve as, as conceptual touchstones as we go on talking today about um, the use and abuse of punk history for life. And so that's a, um, a joke on a title of a Nietzsche essay um, in which the use and abuse of history for life, where um, he's arguing that like a notion of all-encompassing universal Hegelian history is like has a chilling effect on one's sense of agency because it feels like history, it, it has an idea that history is just like happening in these great waves that we have no influence on. But you know, history as it's practiced today, especially radical history, Marxist influenced history, at least as, I'm in an English department, so here I am like talking at you about history. Um, but as, as history, historiography filters into the world of English departments, um, I, as I understand it, you know, this kind of historiography aims to do exactly the opposite of chilling your sense of agency, but in fact is finding and resurrecting and sketching agency wherever it can be found even, and maybe especially in those periods when it seems the most endangered. Whatever increases the availability of source materials for this kind of historiographic work, I say let's have more of it. And so that does mean um, often, and you know, simply based on reality, institutionally based archives over perhaps the more ephemeral and endangered private or community ones. Um, if I think of all the zine libraries and, and anarchist archives that I knew of when I was like touring in bands in the 90s, like are any of them still around? I'm not sure if any of them are. Um, and so I'm, I'm glad that, that there are archives like the one that Lisa has brought into existence. I have so many other things to say about like neoliberalism and archival practices and impasses, but um, I think I'll, I think I'm actually just going to stop there and you can ask me more in the Q&A if you want, but like, I'll just, I'll just leave it there. Thanks. <laughs> Can everyone hear? I don't think I need a microphone. Is this fine?
if I just shout? Yeah? Just shout. Okay, great. Do you want the mic? No, 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 keep it. Yeah, no, it's fine. You guys use it, though. I just wanted to make sure everyone can hear me. Um, well, I think everyone already sort of covered this, this question, but I guess just in general, um, the, your feelings on the advantages and disadvantages of institutional versus community collecting. And then a second part of that question, I guess, Lisa, this would be more for you, is that now working in a major institution, having been part of, um, having been part of the communities and scenes that you're collecting, um, has that granted you clearance or like Ramdashi, you said that you were more willing to donate your um, your zines to NYU because you had known Lisa as part of the Riot Girl community. So was that sort of long and confusing? I'll, I'll start with the end. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, so yes, I'm gonna start with the last thing you said is, um, you know, uh, I used to have a lot of guilt about um, how I'd almost felt nepotistic, um, the collection that I was building, or um, non-objective, or was, is there some sort of conflict of interest that I'm not aware of in the fact that so many of the people I was collecting were friends, and in fact, actually some of them were not friends, but became friends through the process of collecting. Um, and I had this sort of secret shame about that, but at the same time I knew it's what, it, it's like a feminist um, sort of subject knowledge, right? So you have book knowledge, you have school knowledge, and you have lived experience, and that lived experience is what gave me the, the subject knowledge I needed to do the collecting, and it also gave me access to um, the communities, and um, people knew that I wouldn't fuck them over um, because of the ethics I have, or punk ethics. Um, so it's interesting, I sort of came out at a zine librarian unconference where it turned out that everyone starts to feel really emphatically that that sort of subject knowledge is required in this sort of collecting um, and that it's not shameful and it's basically um, continuous with the sort of subjectivity that I think we have as feminists. I know this is not a feminist conference but I'm turning it into one. Um, but punk too, right? I mean like it's, it can be an extension of DIY, right? There's this focus on um, subjectivity I think. So it was really liberating to be at that zine on conference and be like, oh, you know, this is kind of the, the way that we do it. And in, in a way it makes a lot of sense. Um, but it's also hard because it makes me really protective of the, of the collections. Um, and sometimes there's things I can't control about how they're described or how long it takes to process them and it, it tears me apart or how they're misinterpreted. Um, and also something I wonder about is you know, and this is generally for documenting punk in institutions, is this collection is so tied to me as an individual. It's such a small part of my job description. If I were to ever leave this collection, what would happen to it? I really don't think they're gonna find another archivist whose 95% job is to also know about food studies and uh, slave plantations in the 17th century and downtown New York and English literature and is an expert in Riot Girl. Um, so, I, th I think it's almost problematic maybe to make collections so tied up in an individual. The collection will still exist and it's actually well established. Um, and maybe I'm just overinflating my need to interpret and put it in context. So. Oh, I mean, I don't have much more to say. I mean, I just like, yeah, I did feel more comfortable because it was Lisa. Um, and I guess my, exp like, I mean, people are still gonna, when you say community, I'm, are you meaning just people collecting zines? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, I think th regardless of stuff, that's just gonna keep happening. And is, is, you know, people still have their zines and people are still making zines. I don't know. So I think it doesn't, doesn't have any negative effect that I can see, you know? I mean, I just like, I feel as like women, as like a brown person, like, my history is always being erased and disregarded. So I feel like really grateful and proud to be collected in this way. Anything? <laughs> Do you have another? No, you can go. We can share. Um, so this is something 
Lisa and I were talking about at lunch about costs of collections. It's sort of, those of you who are archivists in the room probably know this, but it's kind of a dirty secret in archives that sometimes these collections go for lots of money. And as these things become more desirable, the cost of them are getting higher and higher, so it's limiting the institutions that can buy them. So, you know, if you're Yale or Harvard or whatever, you can fork over a million dollars for, you know, a few boxes of material because it's someone famous. So I'm wondering, you know, how you have dealt with that issue or experienced it. Um, well, first off, you know, there's two collections that I'm talking about. For Riot Girl, every single collection is donated. And I made that decision at the beginning, and it's re it was a really hard decision to make. Well, it wasn't, because we have no money. <laughs> um, but I don't want to perpetuate the idea that women's work is not, does not deserve to be paid for. At the same time, I felt that if money became involved, that it would, be, it would sow dissension with people trying to figure out how many how much different people got and how would you figure that out. So I just discounted it right from the beginning and people can voluntarily donate or they can not. And in some cases there's parts of their archives that they can do a charitable contribution deduction in their taxes. Um, so in downtown we also don't have that much money but we do sometimes acquire archives but for much, much, much less um, money than um, our competitors. Uh, but I think one of the problems with it is, you know, when you do divide up an archive, most rich people are not gonna buy an archive. They're gonna buy the like um, Dead Boys poster or the Ramones lyric sheet or something. They don't want like your um, tax receipts or your whatever, you know. Um, so I think it encourages with when things become more valuable in terms of individual uh, items, in terms of aesthetics and market value, um, it makes it harder for us to collect because people obviously want money, so they're gonna divide up their archives, sell things individually through auction or a bookseller, um, rather than give us that contextualized, research-rich collection that we want. So that's one thought I have. Um, well, another great thing about the Riot Girl collection is they're really tiny. They're from like a half manuscript case to I think the biggest collection is maybe seven record cart and banker boxes. Um, so they've been small enough that I have been able to get my student staff or interns to, to process them really quickly. Um, that's not the case with our bigger collections and it's become a real problem um, and our backlog is growing in terms of downtown because we don't have funding to process. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a big issue and it's, I think it's hard to explain to people that what we're offering is expensive it's not just the space, but it's supplies and the environmental control, and sometimes it's digital repositories, um, digital preservation for audiovisual materials. So we can actually be putting out, you know, fifty thousand dollars for a collection, and then that's very expensive. So. How much is tuition at NYU? <laughs> uh, I think it's like fifty thousand dollars a year. To totally. Yeah, I find it outrageous too because um, our department is extremely underfunded. Um, yeah, um, because I don't think the university sees the value in what we do. Um, while I was at Smith. Um, so I think my questions are more like general, um, just about, I can't, it might have been all of you who had mentioned this, but um, I think how, how does a gender, race, sexual identity, um, how has that been like a determining factor in, in what you write about or what you collect? Is that like a primary focus because um, 
with the oral history project, it felt like this, I feel more of just a sense of urgency of documenting women, women of color who haven't really been represented at all in historical scholarship, um, or have been, you know, they're like footnotes in these fucking rock encyclopedias or something. Um, so that's kind of my mission, as unacademic as that <laughs> may be, but I'm wondering how, how those, how gender, how race, how um, sexual, how that determines what you collect, what, what you write about, and that's for all of you. Um, I think, you know, gender and sexuality are just part of the package of Riot Girl. like, it's a part of what it is, you know what I mean? Um, I think for race, you know, there's been a lot of discussion of, I personally think, and Sarah, maybe you can disagree or agree with me, that Riot Girl kind of had two moments, and this is in a sh really short period of time, a, a first moment of um, mostly punk girls who may be a little bit older, generally working class, poor, um, and also kind of attached to um, academia in some weird ways because of the Evergreen State College. So this kind of weird sophistication um, in this punk um, forest. Um, and then I think the media got a hold of, of Riot Girl and it got disseminated to you know younger girls all over the country who weren't coming out of punk and had a very different experience and dissemination of it. Um, so I think it's hard to say Riot Girl was one thing or the other. Um, but I do think that the criticisms of how Riot Girl approached race are accurate. Um, I think it's really hard to document that because you, you know, some people say it was a white movement. I don't think that's true. I think that um, was different in different local scenes. Um, so one thing I'm trying to do is collect more of the scenes that had more women of color actively involved, like Los Angeles. Um, but at the same time, that there's this tension, and this came up when um, Mimi Nguyen and the um, People of Color scene uh, project uh, donated their materials is um, you want to represent the work that people of color were doing, but at the same time, you don't want to cover up this lack by introducing them into the collection, the zines, I mean. Um, so it's sort of like the, the, the lack of representation in a way kind of represents some parts of Riot Girl. Um, but you don't want to perpetuate it. So there's this weird like thing of attention between accuracy. And Mimi, in her statement that she wrote when she donated it, kind of talked about how um, there was something about that absence that she, oh, she almost wanted to preserve, you know. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't like actively think like, oh, I'm talking about gender, I'm talking about race. It's just like what is it, what it is, and it's like, all these things that have been been imposed on me um, in terms of like what my visual representation is in the world. Um, so of course that's what I, I, I wrote about. Um, I'd rather be thinking about other things, to be honest. Um, but um, I know as far as like, um, I don't know, thinking about I, it's like, it's an interesting, like I feel like oftentimes I'm put in this position when I'm talking about this er, this time period because I'm footnoted a lot as like the black riot girl and it's like awkward and it's it's not, it wasn't, I wasn't the only brown person and I also just, I don't, I don't like the term people of color in general. I think it's, it's also makes no sense like just in terms, I mean, this is a sidebar, but I just feel, always feel like, well, what, what do I have in common with, you know, um, you know, a person of, from Viet, you know, Vietnam, you know, immigrant, you know, parents, or, you know what I mean? Like, I, there's lots of, there's lots of difference. We're not just brown people, you know, like, there's lots of different spectrums. So I, it's like very like, I don't want to be thinking in this like very like white centric way about being a person of color. Um, it's like, it's just not what I identify as. Um, but um, that said, I don't know, I'm just like, uh, what was the, I'm trying to think of what the question was really <laughs> like. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think like, what I, what I, what I, I write about things that I like, like affect me and things that are injustices. And I definitely feel like that has been like, 
geared towards like my by my my identity as my as like a, a black woman and as a queer person um but you know i don't know i'm also just careful like with in this context of just i like to always talk about like i wasn't the only one and that that is the story like like lisa was saying like you know riot girl this whole movement was just a white middle class because that wasn't my experience with it it was a part of it and there was definitely like tension in the whole time of like uh, identity politics kind of splintered lots of um, splintered the movement in this one way that like is sort of almost happening sort of happens now too where um, you know it's a whole that's a whole nother conversation but yeah so um, how does my positioning and my formation in particularly like sexualized or gendered or racialized or allegedly non-racialized ways um, affect what I write about. I think that it shapes my political commitments and then my political commitments shape what I write about, right? So the book that I'm writing right now is not, I wouldn't say I'm writing it because I'm like gendered as female or as queer or whatever in this like range of, of selves. I think that it's because I'm a feminist and because I'm opposed to white supremacy and, and those, those stances, my inclinations politically shape my work. I'll just say very quickly that that was a huge, um, that was a huge factor when I was writing Girls to the Front and my publicist, my, not my publicist, my publisher wanted the, they were suggesting titles that were like, Bikini Kill, Kathleen Hanna, and the story of Riot Girl, you know, stuff like that. And um, and I just was like constantly really, really um, resolute that this was a story about a grassroots movement, the bands were one element of it, and that there were some bands that got famous and lots of other musicians that didn't get famous, and that it was, like I, I really was concertedly writing a social movement history and not like a history of bands, even though everybody was constantly telling me that like it would sell much better if it was just a history of bands. Um, yeah, so my collection is definitely not about the people that everyone has heard of, and that's kind of why I read every single name out. Um, and in terms of the way people actually use the collection, it's mostly kind of thematic or subject driven. So I have, I don't find that people come in just for certain people. They're like looking into issues like manifestos or um, certain aspects of fashion. I mean, the, the breadth of subjects is kind of mind boggling. Um, but something that's kind of related to that is, um, something that's difficult is it's also about who has and hasn't donated, so I really worry that um, Kathleen is the most famous person in my collection, and she also has the best archive. She was really good at saving stuff, um, and it's very rich. Um, so when I'm teaching, I'm often like, oh God, another thing from Kathleen's collection, and I always say that I'm not showing you this to suggest she's the most important person in Riot Girl. At the same time, there's certain people who haven't donated, so I really worry about how that kind of skews that history just by what's actually in the archive and how rich the archive is, in addition to the celebrity issue. Um, well, uh, we have like a lot, we have a publicity collection, which I didn't read off, which is just a collection that Kathy Wilcox's mom saved of all the press. <laughs> um, <laughs> which comes in really handy because if you're looking at the actual stuff against like the Newsweek article or the LA Weekly article or the Sassy issues, um, you can kind of compare the two. So that's kind of how it's represented. Um, and also, it's a little bit of like, say for example, Riot Girl Press when it starts really talks about how it's a response to um, that and that it's a way of controlling the, their own message. Um, so I guess it's another way it's represented Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, like, I, I feel like because of, like, the way, like, internet culture is and the way people, like, fight on the internet about, like, politics and, you know, I guess, I don't know if it's, like, small to, like, my, my queer world or, like, I wouldn't just say punk, but just, 
the way that, um, you know, like the way people want to, um, like take people down in terms of like in in, pol in political like um, what is the world like when you like call, like call out culture I think that was like big and like started being a big thing in the early 90s about people being like you wrote this thing and it's racist or you you did this thing and like then this person would be like the black sheep and like shamed for what they did and you know, it was like a whole big thing. And I'm sure I probably participated in it too. And just getting older, I don't really relate to that style of, of, of I don't really relate to that style of, of um, politics or just even what I care about. Cause I'm always just thinking about like, who is the enemy here? The state, you know, like that is who the enemy, not, you know, like our small little struggling group, you know, like not that to say that, um, you know, people don't need to be called out about certain things or whatever, but I just think it's a good reminder when people start fighting, you know, like, and that, that to me, that that's certain type of fighting of taking people down is a trickle down of patriarchy, is a trickle down of something nasty that we don't want to be part of. That's how I feel, so. Uh, I just that just got me inspired to say that I think one of the uses of the archive um, and also within um, the downtown collection the AIDS activism archive is like you, we can use as activists we can use the archives to learn um, and not recreate the same mistakes that are just like perpetually recreated in activist communities and I just remember when Occupy was happening, I was like, come to Fails, come look at these records of the AIDS activist groups like ACT UP and Grand Fury. I know you're gonna learn a lot. You're also gonna learn a lot of great techniques for like disseminating your ideas. Um, so I just wanted to say that. We're going to take a little short break, so about 2.30, and then uh, Byron and Lydia are going to come up, and we're going to continue the discussion. So, thank you.